As a Christian, you know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. It's a beautiful truth that we can revel in, and not just at the end of our lives, but every day. Psalm 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God wants good for us. Matthew 7, chapter 11, Jesus picks up on this same truth throughout Scripture. He's explaining to the people that just as our, God is our heavenly Father of those who are his adopted children in faith, you can look to earthly fathers and see earthly fathers give good things to their kids. How much more our Father in heaven? He says it like this. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus is explaining that we should expect good gifts from our Father. In fact, in James chapter 1, we're told that every good and perfect gift comes from our Father who is in heaven. We're not only told that he will give us good things, things that will bring us joy, we're actually commanded to rejoice. Philippians 4.4 4 tells us, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. The Christian life is one in which we are promised and should pursue joy. Even in our suffering, we are able to have joy. Amen to that. So Christians then should not be the ones who, everywhere we go, throughout the ages, somber and solemn. We're not the miserable ones. We're not the come follow us. We are those who face all sorts of things with joy. And we expect that God will do things in our lives that will bring joy. And while it is certainly true that the day will come in the end, after the return of our Lord, where that joy will be made secure, it'll find full consummation, we look for and expect moments and seasons and times of great joy now. Now, in addition to this beautiful truth that God gives us joy and that we should pursue joy here and now, we also know that every day God's word makes demands on us. It instructs us how to live, how to behave, how to get married, how to raise kids, how to make friends and conduct business, how to relate to our family, our neighbors, our church, even our civil government. So here's the question. What should a Christian do when the commands of God's word seem incompatible with his promise to give us joy? I ask this because we're all going to have to face these types of realities quite regularly if we're being honest with ourselves. Imagine a few categories where this might play out. Uh, imagine you're a young man or a young woman. You start dating someone. Maybe you get engaged even. Fall in love. And then you find out that that person's not a Christian, and you are. You see, God commands that a believer not bind him or herself to a non-believer. But he also says that he wants joy for you, and, and being with this person brings you joy. So if God wants me to have joy, then, then what do I do? What if your spouse makes you miserable? Well, you read the Bible and you know that the Lord hates divorce. He doesn't say you can just send away your wife for any reason. You can just cast away your husband for any reason. You may not do that. Okay, so... If you're supposed to have joy, but going home every day to a wife that hates you, makes you miserable, well, then how do you square that? Because the Lord tells you, go home, but have joy. What if your business partner begins making unethical decisions? Someone who used to be a dear friend of yours, someone you trusted and cared for. You realize, I might have to give up this friendship or this job. That might not give me joy. What if a man starts feeling attracted to other men? Or if a woman starts feeling attracted to other women? 
And then that, that Christian then opens the Bible and says, God says that homosexual behavior is a sin, but he wants me to be happy, doesn't he? People deal with these issues every day. And in our world, more and more and more, people have been told, coached, discipled by our world to follow the path that makes sense to us, irrespective of what God says. Why? Because they say there can't be an incompatibility. And if there is one, if you sense that there is one, trust your heart over this. When a person asks this question, it's significant. How can God's promise for my joy work if I stay married to this miserable wife? How can God's purpose in bringing me joy and me being happy today work if I have to quit my job or move away from home or end a relationship with somebody? How does that work? It's at these points we need to be bolstered in our faith. We need to trust the promise of God when what he has commanded seems to point contrary to it. You understand what I'm saying? That there are times where we know, rejoice in the Lord, no good thing will God withhold from those who walk uprightly. That's pointing here. But, but then you want me to, to turn away from this thing that gives me joy? What do I do with these seemingly contradictory sentiments. The times like this that the life of Abraham may be grateful, greatly serving to us as believers. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning. If you have your Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter 11. We've been in the roll call of faith, which is a list of faithful saints in the Old Testament telling us of what they did and of their faith that we might look back and see that they were faithful how much more can we be faithful? We're to be encouraged by these stories. And each one is connected to a person that had slightly different experiences and can provide slightly different encouragements to us. We're going to be in Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm going to read those three verses out loud, pray, and then we're going to go back through. We're actually going to spend a significant amount of, amount of our time in the original story this points to in Genesis 22. So be prepared to turn there if you'd like to follow along today. Let's read Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Let's pray. Father, as we consider this incredibly famous, uh, critical story, um, this moment in history, in time, I pray that you would help us to uh, cross any chasm, cross any bridge that needs to be crossed to make application points, to understand what's going on, to really soak in it, to draw from it what you want from us today. Oh Lord, help me to be a faithful preacher, to not stray either from what is true, um, to stray into area that's unclear or unhelpful. Father, keep me on the straight. And Father, help me stay true to what the point of this text really is for the benefit of your people. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. This story goes back to the life of Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. If you weren't here with us last week, we started on the life of Abraham a little bit because prior to these verses, we saw the beginning of Abraham's uh, plan in, in Scripture, back to Genesis chapter 12. He was the father of the Jews. First one, as he's called a Jew even, he Hebrew. He'd been chosen by God to bear many nations, to be the man who would bring about descendants that would outnumber the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. His story begins in Genesis chapter 12. I'm just going to quickly read out loud for you again the three verses that kick off Abram's story. Back when he was called Abram, prior to being renamed Abraham by the Lord. 
Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's built upon this incredibly important three verses, this promise made to Abraham that we'll see his life story play out. Today we're going to spend most of our time in Genesis 22, which brings us to this particular part of Abraham's story. If you want to follow along, you can go there. I will put the pertinent slides up uh, so you can follow along there if you'd prefer that. Because the origin of this reference takes us back to that time in his life. Abram was chosen by God. And after that, some pretty significant events took place. If you're not familiar with the story, I'll try to kind of revisit it for a moment. God promised to Abraham, hey, your descendants are going to be numerous, and I'm going to bless the world through your descendants. He had in his mind the singular offspring, Jesus, who will come through Abraham's line that will bless the world. And Abraham, being an old man, knows he's kind of in trouble because not only is he an old man at the time, he's 75 when he's given this call, his wife is 65. And she's barren. Not only has she not had any children yet, but she can't have any children from that point forward. And so they think, well, how is this going to work out? God gave a promise. We want to follow through with what he's commanded for us to do. He's told us he's going to bring about this great and mighty thing. There has to be a way. So Abraham and Sarah have a lapse in good judgment. And because they were unable to see how God could fulfill his promise without their cunning intervention, they come up with an alternate plan. Sarah gives her servant, Hagar, to Abraham to conceive a son on her behalf. Now, if your gut reaction is this, it's right. This is a terrible idea. Terrible. It's actually crazy that she comes up with it. It seems the kind of thing the man might come up with. Hey, I got an idea. But the Bible tells us she introduces this idea. Okay, there's supposed to be this child, at least one, maybe more. I can't give you kids, so so maybe my servant can do that. It does, however, in fact, produce a male heir, Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn son. The story continues to tell us throughout this narrative account that uh, Hagar and Sarah, of course, as you'd expect, then start to butt heads. The Lord promises to care for Hagar even in spite of this wicked situation. Now, it seems that Abraham and Sarah must have felt validated in their shrewd scheme. Uh, The way that they talk about Ishmael, oh, he's the one then, right? Lord, uh, bring the promises through Ishmael. We we took care of this for you, God. Softball for you. Lobbed up an easy one. After all, look, we got you a male heir. We got you off the hook, kind of. Quick note, though, on this. I've known people, I bet you have too, maybe yourself in the situation at some point, who've chosen to sin against clear biblical teaching, against wise counsel, against any measure of reasonable judgment. They've chosen to do what they want in spite of all of those things. Consider this. Consider when a Christian knowingly marries a non-Christian. Right? I introduced that thought earlier. When a Christian says, I'm I'm, I'm doing it anyway. I know what the Bible says. I know he's not a believer. But maybe maybe someday he'll get there. If we just quickly get married, make all this legit, then everyone will accept us. Even though my parents are saying no, my church is saying no, the word of God says no, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Because I love him. God would want me to be happy. I'm doing it. Sometimes that sin by God's loving mercy and kindness, eventually produce some good things. Beautiful children. Maybe a happy home. Maybe things are pretty peaceful. Maybe just earthly prosperity. He has a good job, and they're taken care of, and they can be an active part of their community. Maybe even they end up going to a church someday, and they have good relationships, and maybe God blesses them with children. This exceptional blessing of kids. In some cases like this, a Christian may feel justified in their prior decision. Look, 
Look, it's a good thing. It's a good thing I, I did that. Because look at the blessing that we get because of it. And the pragmatics of all of it give points to that category. In fact, I have known Christians in these types of situations to then therefore go on and provide counsel to do the same sin that they had done. Because in the end, it all worked out. But we ought not presume upon God's mercy. We should take care to not think that our sin is ever vindicated by a seemingly positive result. Good ends never justify sinful means. Ever. Abraham and Sarah may have thought like this. It worked. It might not have been great in the moment, but we're there. We got it. We're past it. The faster we get past that sin, we can just look back and just kind of forget about it. For Abraham and Sarah to so use this young woman, Hagar, in this way was certainly sinful. There's no, there's no way around this. This was sin. They should never have done this. There was nothing commendable about that situation. Sometimes when you read through, especially the book of Genesis, which is kind of a quick history of the, the patriarchs to set up what's going to happen in the rest of the Bible, okay? It's not written by a person who lived through that time. It's written by a person who came 400 years later. Moses writes about the periods of time back, even thousands of years prior. He's writing about these events. He gives us a quick history, and he rarely gives us an evaluation about right and wrong. He just tells us the facts and keep going. And so when you read through Genesis, you can kind of go, well, was that right or wrong? They didn't say. It's really easy. Just read through the text. Nothing commendable. Nothing imitable. All of it is bad here. In fact, we can even see that God never validates Abraham's union with Hagar. Never. He never goes, okay, I didn't like the idea at first, but... I'm on board now. Never happens. In fact, we can see this, we can observe this in the way that he never once will refer to Hagar as Abram's wife. He only ever calls her the servant or the slave woman, even when the Lord is speaking to her. He doesn't validate, okay, fine, you are the wife now. He slept with you, so he doesn't do that. Second, he permits Abraham when there's finally conflict between Abraham, uh, Abraham's wife Sarah, and, and the new child of promise Isaac, who was given supernaturally when she was, she was like 90 years old. Between Sarah and, and between uh, Hagar, God actually says, send the woman away. How could God, who hates divorce, say, send that wife away? Because she's not his wife. She's a mistress. And the son is already of, uh, of the age to head out on his own. He's, he's already over 15 at this point, you know. He's at the age where he can go be a young man and go out. And God promises to bless him and care for him. And God says, send the woman out. She can go. Listen to your wife and send your mistress away. At the same time, though, God responds to all of this with extraordinary grace, extraordinary grace. And it is still this Abraham who will become the father of nations by supernatural means. God opens Sarah's womb at the age of 90 to give her a baby, Isaac, this child of promise. She conceives supernaturally. God even provides for and cares for Hagar, this girl who was used to this whole situation. I'm sure she wasn't faultless, but God shows up. I'll care for you too. I will be your God. He cares for Ishmael. I I will be your God. God was working his plan exactly as he had said that he would, even in spite of their interception. God shows up, and just in his good grace. Brothers and sisters, to wrap that thought up, never think that because a good result uh, here and now comes about, that we should therefore then try to reproduce that by the same means. Don't do that. There are sometimes that churches make really, really, really bad Bible op- opposite from the Bible decisions. But someone got saved. God is just good. He's just gracious. He's not waiting for you to get everything perfect, to square away and kick out all the sin before you'll get any good blessings. Sometimes God just blesses because he's good. He's a good and loving, generous, kind, merciful father. And this... This amazing grace, this this merciful provision of Isaac anyway, you're still the man that I chose. I'm still going to do this through you. Sarah, you've never been a mother. You're 90. You've always wanted to be one. 
You don't even, you haven't adopted kids even. You, 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 you don't have anything. I will give you a child. God is so merciful to them. And this is what makes what happens next so striking. Genesis 22. Let's start at the beginning of that part of the story. Verses 1 and 2. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Right off the bat, we see that God is going to test Abraham. In fact, it's helpful to see this. The word test is used both in the Genesis account and it's repeated in Hebrews 11. God tested Abraham. In other words, God never intended for Abraham to kill his son. That's made very clear throughout this entire story. He is testing Abraham. And what does he test him with? He says to him, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Did anyone catch the wording there? Only son. Only son. In fact, some translations will will put only begotten son. Only begotten, just like it says in John 3 about Jesus. Wait, Isaac was born maybe 15-something years after Ishmael. He already has a son. So why is Isaac called the only son? The Bible refers to him this way for a reason. First, it is Isaac who will be the son of promise. He is the one through whom that promise to multiply into generations, nations full of people. He's the one who will carry that promise. Number two, at this point in the story, Ishmael's already been sent off to start new nations, to go, to go prosper in another place that God will bless him. He's going off on his own. So he's not under his care as a son in that way anymore, but probably more to the point, Isaac will be the son of promise. And lastly, just consider this. Isaac... Listen carefully. Isaac is the firstborn son of Abraham. I'm not trying to be tricky here. But Ishmael was the firstborn son of Abram. Okay. Now, this isn't just semantics. I want you to consider this for a second. I told you earlier that Abram was his original name, given by his his father. Uh, God will, after Ishmael is born... Speak again to Abram and say, I will change your name to Abraham. And Abraham will be the father of many nations. And it is at that point that he gives him this covenant sign of circumcision, which he didn't have when Ishmael was conceived. People wonder sometimes, what's the significance of circumcision? That's really odd. Why that thing be the the thing that is an evidence, outward evidence of the fact that I'm a person of God in the Old Testament for a man? Why? Why? Well, because at the point of conception of every child, there was to be a reminder that we are people who are honoring the promise of the Lord. That's why. Right there at the moment of conception, that was supposed to be thought, that was supposed to be present in that kind of moment. Isaac is the first one who's conceived after circumcision is given. And Isaac is the only son at this point born to newly named Abraham. Does that make sense? I think that's more significant than just name change. I think that that means that there's a kind of newness of seizing of Abram. You are now Abraham. And therefore, Isaac is distinctly the son of promise in such a way that he can be referred to as his only son. And again, he'll do this one more time in this account. Uh, God will refer to Isaac as the only son. That's what's in mind. But what he says about this only son is actually far more shocking and the fact that he calls him only. I want you to take this son and go to the land of Moriah, that's Jerusalem, future Jerusalem, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This, this is what is shocking. Go kill your son. Now, murder, of course, at this point has already been uh, claimed as a uh, law-breaking activity. God has commanded no man to take the blood of man. He says, even if an animal takes the blood of a man, kill that animal. You can kill all the animals you want. Don't kill a man. That's what God says to Noah after he gets off the ark. Here's your law. Don't kill. Because the last time we started with one family, they gave birth to Cain and Abel, and murder was the first thing. So now we're starting fresh all over again. One family started it again. No killing. No killing each other. 
So that is out there. But I, people have asked before, well, wait a second. In the law of Moses, it makes it very clear. Old Testament, Old Covenant law, it makes it very clear you may not burn your children as sacrifices. It says it like, very clear because that's what some of the Canaanites used to do. So isn't God telling him to do exactly the opposite of what the Old Testament law said there? Something to just bear in mind, Abraham precedes the law by 400 years. Four centuries later will that law be codified and written, okay? You and I don't live in the same period of time, in the same, uh, the, the same frame of mind even, than Abraham would be. I don't think it'd be possible for God to go to you and tell you to kill your kid. Why? Because in our day, New Covenant Day, we already have a sacrifice that has finished all the sacrifices. That's why. That's why you and I could never be in this exact situation. But Abram could. And Abraham was told, go sacrifice the son of promise. God has been working with Abraham for decades. He's been promising that this Isaac would be a son and would be his heir. He even clearly made it, made it, it was isn't just like, go kill that, that son and I'll give you another one later. No, no, no. God made this super clear. Genesis 17, 21, prior to this, he says, I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. God calls him out by birthday, by name. That one will be the one. And then he tells him, go kill him. So not only is he being told, go kill your son, but he's being told, go kill the son that I have promised will turn into many nations. So whether it was just Abraham's response to Killing his kid, or the other side, less emotional, but just rational. Well, God, how will that work? Either way, what an incredibly heavy blow to be dealt to Abraham. And how did he respond? Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Abraham obeyed without delay. He just got up. The retelling of this story by Moses, writing this down, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, records nothing in the ways of an argument, or even a question, or even a challenge. Uh, but God, wait, Did, don't you remember the promise? Nothing's recorded here for us, just obedience. Unlike Moses, who will go, oh God, no, not me, I, I, can't, I can't go back to, to Egypt. Whoa, 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 you need someone else. Unlike Gideon, oh, I'm not so sure, God. Maybe you provide a couple miracles and then I'll know. Both of whom will be commended in Hebrews 11, for the record. Unlike those men, Abraham listens the first time, even to such a heartbreaking command. One that would, would have even been nonsensical. It seems an obvious place to pause and ask us as believers today whether or not you and I would have done the same thing if we were in his shoes. Again, not in our day, but if we were there. If all the necessary conditions for this type of thing were offered up, what would we do? It's a heavy challenge. You see the faith here of Abraham. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. It takes three days to make the journey from the south portions of what would become Israel. He was in Beersheba. Uh, he was uh, in the Philistine territory, it says in the chapter before this. And then he travels the three-day march up to what will become Jerusalem. There's a bunch of hills up there. One of those is Mount Moriah. That's where he's going to sacrifice or offer the sacrifice. Can you imagine what that journey must have been like? Like how many opportunities there would have been to turn around or, oh, I twisted my ankle, I can't go on, or, you know. I mean, all of those things. Listen, I don't know what the inner prayers of Abraham must have been at this moment. Neither do you. But we do know that the record given to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is he gets up and he goes. And he doesn't tell anybody about this. He's keeping this to himself three days. Can you, can you just imagine? How do you sleep? Carrying this weight, wondering what's going to happen. And when he gets to within eyesight of the mount where he's supposed to go. He turns to the servants, his young men, and he says, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, this is lost a little bit in English, uh, but in, in both Greek and in Hebrew, those verbs are all plural verbs. 
So in other words, it would read like this. Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy, we will go over there. We will worship and we will come again to you. So we're going there and we are coming back. That's what he says. How can he say that if he knows that he's supposed to go kill Isaac? It may sound like wishful thinking. It may be he's just lying because he doesn't want them to know what he's going to go do. Or he's not ready to say it in the hearing of his son in case Isaac tries to make a break for it or something. But the author of Hebrews, I think, gives us a little more insight in here in telling the motivation for this. I think Abraham meant this. We will come back. Why? Because that's what he's being commended for in Hebrews 11. He believed even if his son died, God would raise him from the dead if he had to because he will keep his promise. So Abraham can say, we're going. We will come back. I think, I think that's what he means. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. What do you think he meant? Do you think he meant, you're the lamb that will be provided? Because I'm going to have to kill you. Do you think he's picturing uh, another miracle to take place? God will give some other lamb? We don't know exactly. But he's right. God will provide. God will provide. I will sacrifice what God gives me to sacrifice. I will do that. Think about stories in the Old Testament and you kind of want to view them, like just watch a video clip of it, right? See, like, what did that look like? How did that actually go down? Was there interaction? This is one of those. I I just wish I could see. I don't know. Was there protest? Did Abraham, like, pounce? Like, did he say, oh, can you just put the wood on the fire? And he goes, he's doing this. He just grabs him real quick, like in that police hold real fast, you know, and do that. Um, did Isaac, whoa, what are you doing? What are you doing? What, 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 what's happening? Did Abraham solemnly, without a word, just push him on the fire with tears in his eye? And we, don't, we don't know. We don't, we don't have any of that. Here's what we do have, and this is what's significant. This, this, is how the, this is the way we view how the Bible was given to us. This wasn't just God saying, hey, uh, how would you tell that story? Oh, that's sufficient. Write that in there. This actually was inspired. God wanted these words to be penned, and God wanted these words to persist for us today. So in other words, this record is given this way for a reason. There's a reason we're not told there's any protest. We're just told he's put on there. Why? Because this story is supposed to remind us of Jesus, who had no protest at his death, who went like a lamb before his shearers is silent. Without resistance, Jesus wasn't looking for a place to make a break for it when there was an opening in the crowd. Jesus went. And I think this is supposed to prepare us for the true story that will come 2,000 years later in Jesus. This probably took place around 2000 BC. Close to that. 1800, 2000, something like that. God will provide the lamb. How true that will be. And here's the crux of the story. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. God provided by stopping this sacrifice from taking place. Abraham, Abraham. He says it twice. That's an emphatic. That's why there's an exclamation point. This is is a making sure he stops. 
I've seen pictures before and heard images like he's holding the knife over. We don't know how he's holding it. He just put, took the knife out. He has the knife out. And what's he planning to do with it? He's planning to slaughter his son. I don't think that Abraham was going to stand there and go, I'm not doing it, Lord, because you're going to do something. You're going to stop this. Remember, Hebrews 11 will tell us that he was ready for him to be dead and then have to be raised again. He was actually going to do it. I don't know how, Lord, but after he's dead, somehow you're still going to work this out. He was really going to do it. But that's as far as he needed to go. One question for you. Why does, why does it say then, now I know, for now I know, you fear God? Good question for you. This comes down to a view on the omniscience of God. You know what the word omniscience means? All knowing. Science, it's the word for knowledge, shant, scient there, omni, all. God is all knowing. The doctrine of God's all knowingness is all over the Bible. In fact, it's in this story. God didn't have to experience particular events in order to know what would happen. This happens to us all the time, right? Like, what will happen if you do this? I don't know. It's only one way to find out. Light those firecrackers on fire. Put them in the, the dishwasher. Who knows? We have to try. You come up with your thing. You, just, you have to experience to see what's going to go down. This is not the way that God knows things. L- look, at what it, look at what he already told the, these people. He already told them, you will have a son a year from now. Bam! How did he know that? Because God knows all. God, God says to them, it will be Isaac that that promise will go through and that I will bless many nations. So God knew Isaac was going to survive this. God knew what was going to go down. God knew, God knew all of this. All throughout this story, God knows what's going to happen. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy being fulfilled, being fulfilled, being fulfilled. God did not learn new information. We do not think of God as one who has to learn like we have to learn. Sometimes people say that, like, well, God has to look into the future to appear and go, well, I'm not, I'm not sure what will happen. Let's look. Oh, that will happen. It doesn't work that way. Additionally, God's knowledge is not like a library of events written down that if you were to ask God, what, what will happen if, let me check the source and go over there and pull it off and recall, doesn't work that way. All of God's knowledge is perfectly known always. He doesn't have to remember. He just knows. And he knows all things from beginning to the end. All of it. His knowledge is complete. But we see these kinds of statements like this, especially in Genesis, actually more than in other places. We call them anthropomorphisms. That's the big word. It's just talking about God and his emotions as though he was a person in order to help us understand him. To understand the emotions, the relation of God, what it is that was going on in his mind. Sometimes the Lord gives us some insight into that. This event had to take place. God didn't just go, listen, I know what would happen because I know everything. So you don't, we, just, we can just do away with all of this almost sacrifice business. Abraham needed to experience this. Isaac needed to experience this so that you and I could read about it today. So that we are still served by this. God knows all things from beginning to end, but we don't. But now we know something about God and us that we wouldn't have known otherwise. And we know about Abraham that he actually did act in faith. You know that faith that Abraham has had? It's actually put to work here. We actually see it playing out. He actually believed that somehow God's promise would remain true even if he killed his son. This test was for Abraham and for us. And look what happens next. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Here we see what we call substitutionary atonement. Atonement is offering a sacrifice in order to appease our God, in order to to, to relate again with him. To have peace with God. at one meant, as I've heard people say, it's kind of a helpful way to think about atonement. Being brought into relationship again with God. Substitutionary, it's a substitute, an alternate. Something else died so that 
atonement could happen. In other words, think about it like this. God did not say, pass the test, Abraham. You guys can get off this mountain. Go, get out of here. Nothing like that. The sacrifice was still necessary. There will be blood. Something is going to die on this altar. Something will be burned on that wood that was carried up there. God demanded a sacrifice, and a sacrifice would be had. This is one of the things people don't realize about our perfect, perfect just God. Justice will prevail. God doesn't just go, ah, forget about the sins. Ah, forget about judgment. Ah, forget about justice. Who cares? Anything goes. It doesn't work that way. If he did that, he'd be a wicked judge. God is a just judge. And when he commands for something to happen, it will. There will be a death. Something will die on that altar. But by God's good provision, it was not Isaac, but the ram, the substitute. Substitutionary atonement as a doctrine is under fire these days. If you don't know this, it's swimming in intellectual circles. It'll, it'll trickle itself down. It already has in many places and in many ways. But you need to know that the whole Bible speaks to this idea of a substitute offering. I've had uh, random people on the street, atheists, uh, some people who grew up in a Christian background. I don't understand. How could that guy's death, that guy, Jesus, him dying, have anything to do with me? A challenge. Well, his death doesn't affect me. He just provided a, a, an example to love God enough that you obey to the point of death. So we should just do that too. His, what does his death have to do with me? Everything. He's the substitute. The whole Bible says this all the way back to the beginning. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we see it say, For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We were the unrighteous ones to be on the altar. Jesus was the righteous one, not needed to be on the altar, and he took that place. Get off the altar, I'll get on it, Jesus says. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he bore your sins. That's what we needed. Someone to die in our place. He took your sins, put them on him. He took your dirty, filthy, sinful robes, put them on himself, took his pure, white, perfect ones, put them on us. And he laid down and said, kill me. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. Brothers and sisters, if you want to have, if you want to have eternal life, believe in Jesus and that trade will happen to you. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Believe that he is perfect and you are not. That he went to a cross a cross that should have been yours. Believe that he died in your place so that when you stand before the Lord someday and if he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? The answer could be, I deserve to have died, but your son died for me instead. That's the Christian faith, believing in that. God provided a substitute. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. I want to deal with one more pretty critical question that arises from a text like this. People read this account. They read this account of this ancient deity who told this primitive man, go kill and burn your son. How could God do such a thing? Well, don't you know he's going to rescue him? Sure. But how could he do that? How could, how could he so toy with the man's emotions like that? How could he torture a father like that? That father waited a hundred years to have this boy. How, how could God be so cruel? Brothers and sisters, you need to know God is not a man that he could be judged like us. He can do things while remaining sinless, that if you and I did them, it would be sin. Did you ever think of that? God can do something and it is not sin. If we did it, it would be sin. Uh, simple things. Uh, God can receive worship. You cannot. You receive worship, sin. In fact, God has st strike people dead for that. He can receive worship. Why? Position. God is creator. We are creation. We are not on the same page. We, we, we are not the same species. 
He is altogether different than his creation, and he can and do things, and it be righteous, where if we did them, it would be wrong. God can say, destroy the earth with a flood and wipe out every living thing, and it is not sin for him to do that. If you and I did, it would be. Why? Because it is his creation. He can do with it whatever he wants. It is not yours. This is the fundamental problem with every sin. If you and I were to kill a person, the main problem is that we were taking a life that doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. That life doesn't primarily belong to that person. It belongs to God. We stole from the creator in such action. That's what makes it sin. God is not to be judged by man. Guys, we have examples of this all over the place, even at a human level. I may sleep with my wife. None of you all may. Why? Position. I'm I'm her husband, not you. How about this one? Um, I can spank my kids. I ought to spank my kids. They may not spank each other. And we have to deal with this every day in the Sanford household. (laughs) Parents, you know. Grandparents, you know. If you babysat someone's kids, you know. Listen, sure, there could be a wrong kind of physical discipline, but we are commanded by the Lord to spank our children, to to drive out undisciplined wickedness, folly. I may spank my son and it be right and God-honoring, but if he tries to spank his sister, guess what? He's getting another one. Because of position, you may not do it. It would be sin. I may do it. I may do it, and it would not be sin. We actually teach our kids, there's some words they're not allowed to say that sometimes we'll say. Not really, okay, don't think, uh, stupid. I don't want my kids saying that word. But it's in the Bible. Why am I allowed to do that and they aren't? Well, because they're so young, they don't know how to use their words properly yet. Guess what? I can carry a gun around, I don't let my two-year-old do that. You have to learn to respect those things before you're given the right to use them and wield them rightly. Position. Brothers and sisters, that, that's at a human level. How much more? God and us. This is so critical. Guys, so critical to get this in your mind because today many people, even Christians, assume that God must reason, act, judge like one of us. Well, he has to follow all the rules we do. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He can be sinless and do things that in your eyes, or if you did them, they would be sin. He can do that. He does it all the time. And if you were to go in with judgment, let's see, let's see if God sins. Let's see if this was sinful, brothers and sisters. Every time that someone turns to God in judgment in the Bible, God stands that man up and says, how dare you? Who are you, O oh man, to judge the living God? He is judge and we are not. In fact, the way that you and I may even evaluate what we do is either good or bad is by measuring it up against God, his standard, not the inverse. We never take God the judge and put him down beneath us and us in the seat of judge. He is judge. And Abraham's response here shows exactly how a man of faith should respond to God in worship. Worship. So what happens? This whole, the whole event takes place. Think of the emotion just washing over this father. Oh my God. Goodness. Have you ever thought about what the relationship must have been like with Isaac and Abraham after that point? You thought about that? I don't know what it's like. God, are you, are, hey, Dad, are you going to do that again to me? Just like all of a sudden bind me and try to kill me? Like, so any other father, son, get together again, I got to watch my Like you don't know what, I mean, all the, all the human dynamics that we don't get in the story, right? I'm not even being silly. I mean, I mean, serious. We don't even know exactly how that plays out. We just know the Lord did something mighty. And what's the response at the end of this? Abraham doesn't go, geez, God, that was mean. What does he do? You are a provider. You gave me a lamb. You gave me the life of my son. He comes skipping down the mountain, and what does he come down saying? Not with this, not with a sullen, God brought me through this really rough time. Why would he do? He came down saying, the Lord's the provider. He provides. And that, that, that saying went out, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. We don't whine about what God has done. We consider it joy. Worship is the response of a man or a woman of faith. 
when we endure loss and we endure things that we experience from the Lord that we don't understand. God, why? I've tried to be faithful and then this marriage is falling to bits. Why would you, why would you bring me through this? No. The Lord has promised good for us and he will provide it. We are not to judge him on that. We are to trust him, trust him and seek worship. Back to the text and we'll close. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. This is in Hebrews again, Hebrews eleven nineteen. 19. This gives us an insight into this story because it tells us something that every other retelling of this Abraham Isaac situation doesn't tell us. This tells us that he knew somehow that God would even raise him from the dead. This doesn't say, well, he didn't think that God would let him go through with it. No. God will fulfill his promise. He will. And if I don't understand how Isaac's death turns into billions of grandkids, if I don't understand that, I don't have to because God promised. He promised. Brothers and sisters, you and I are going to look around at the world today and we might go, Jesus promised to build his church. He's going to win this battle. He's going to make all of his enemies a footstool for his feet. Not one inch of this creation is he going to lose. All of it is his. And we're in those moments where we're like, but but Christians are dying or they're being persecuted or it seems like the church is just from the inside out rotting. How is this going to work? We have faith. God knows. He knows what he's going to do. And we move forward in faith as Abraham did. Abraham, Isaac's story here points us to the sacrifice of Jesus. You see Jesus all over this, don't you? We can see Jesus in Abraham. Jesus had faith like Abraham had faith. And while Abraham had a kind of faith, Jesus' great faith was greater. Jesus, of course, we can see as a kind of Isaac, an only son brought up by this father to be placed on an altar as sacrifice. We even see the, the, the language. Did you see it here? The wood laid on the back of Isaac. You carry up the wood for your own sacrifice. There's, like, there's, there's some things in here that remind us of Jesus, right? So Jesus is a kind of Isaac, a greater Isaac. He'll carry his own cross up to the top of the mount to die on it. He did it without protest. We don't see any protest here. But mostly, we see Jesus in the ram. Mostly, we see Jesus in the ram. In other words, he's the substitute sacrifice. Primarily, Jesus is not the Isaac. Brothers and sisters, we are the Isaac. We're the ones that the altar was made for. We're the ones that should have died there. But the substitute rescued us from death. That's the point. Ultimately, you and I are like Isaac and rescued by a moment of death by God's perfect provision. You might know the exact place where Abraham offered the substitute sacrifice in place of his son would eventually become the exact place over which his descendants would build the Jerusalem temple where the sacrifices were brought in to atone for sins. That same place. If angels had fixed their eyes on that spot in geography from heaven, they would continue to see sacrifice after sacrifice starting here with Isaac substituted by a lamb. It would be that same hilltop, the same place where Abraham's offspring would place their Messiah on a cross. He started at that same mount and marched down to his death. He was condemned there. And the point of this text is that this was faith, not foolishness. And it is commendable. These verses are here to commend Abraham's faith in such a remarkable moment in history. When God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank. This is for our encouragement. Do you remember what Abraham's faith was in? That God was going to take this son that he just commanded me to kill, and he's going to make that son into nations. And it is true that there was fulfillment of some of the promises that God made to Abraham during his lifetime, Isaac's birth, him rescuing him from, from death here at this moment. And he even experienced miracles on those occasions. Supernatural birth. Uh, He provided the ram supernaturally. Spoke to him out of heaven. But the greatest promise given to Abraham would not be experienced in his lifetime. He did not die having received the fulfillment of the promise 
but still waiting for it. And yet he persisted in faith. So not only did Abraham believe God concerning Isaac's birth and when he offered him on Mount Moriah, but he continued to believe God even when the greater promises were not yet fulfilled. And this is the encouragement of this text. This is why it is in Hebrews chapter 11 that you and I can be encouraged because we have seen the fulfillment of the promise he was still waiting for. Therefore, how much more should we remain faithful? God has promised that he will work everything out according to the purpose of his will. Everything. He's working it. And everything that happens to us in our lifetime will ultimately be for his glory and our good. And we can believe that every bit as much as Abraham should have believed in God's promise back on that mount. Let's pray. Father, you have been so good to us. You have provided your son as a substitute sacrifice. I pray that for any non-believer here would begin seeing that image so clearly. Maybe in the story of Abraham, some of those things can come to light. One was supposed to die, was, was commanded by the Lord to die, but a replacement was made that in God's economy, he's worked it out such that he can trade a life for a life. And he's done so with Jesus, that the life of Jesus can pay for the lives of all on this world who ever have and ever will believe in him. Father, I pray that this would produce saving faith in many people. Lord, I pray that as believers that we would continue to believe in your promise, that you will do what you have said you will do, that the day will come, Lord, where we will look back at the events of this age, the events of our lifetime, and we will say, thank you, Lord, that was a perfect story. Lord, you are perfect. You know all things. You have planned them from ages past. And we pray, Lord, that we'd be able to trust you even when it seems like your promises will not come to fruition. Help us to reject that nonsense and trust you and your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' good name. Amen.